All right, thanks. Welcome, everybody. So the, my plan for today is to talk about uh, car electron tomography, which uh, I don't think it has been um, talked about in this uh, series. So hopefully it will be stimulating. And I, I have you know, essentially one goal for this presentation. So you know, if I had to guess out of the, I don't know how many, over 100 people in this audience, I would probably guess that maybe 25% no, of you or maybe 30% of you are actually doing tomography and the rest are probably more into you know, single particle or doing both. So hopefully after this talk, I will uh, convince you that uh, actually, you know, clarity is a very fertile ground for method development, which I think it's the main uh, focus of this uh, seminar series. So that would be my goal for this talk. And it may seem counterintuitive. So if you look at the title of my talk, it's either uh, crowd electron tomography, high speed or high resolution. And uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is how do you actually achieve both high speed and high resolution. And for that, I'm gonna talk about uh, data collection, which may seem you know, the completely opposite from method development. But the purpose of doing this is to actually, you know, stimulate the development of methods, which I think are, you know, pretty much needed in this, uh, in this entire field of cryo electron tomography. So I will present today a bisect, which is a, a strategy for collecting two series at high speed and high resolution. And because cryo -ET is a new um, topic in, in this series, I will just give you know, a couple of introductory slides. Um, essentially, the, the main difference in cryo electron tomography compared to single particle cryo EM is that we're taking multiple images of each area of our sample. And the way we do that is we tilt the specimen uh, uh, into different orientations, and then for each of those orientations, we take a projector and image, and then using computational techniques, we can combine those 2D projector and images from the same object into a 3D. Uh, reconstruction, which we usually call uh, a tomogram, uh, that represents the, the, the 3D density of the sample that we're looking at. And the way the tilting happens in the microscope is by actually uh, tilting the stage. So this is you know, mechanical tilting of the stage. And then at each angle, uh, we take all these projections and then we combine them together. So this is obviously a lot more complicated than just doing a straight single particle. Um, but there is obviously a good reason why we want to do this. And one of the main things that you can do with crowd -ET is you can actually look at uh, proteins in their native state, right? So you don't need to be, uh, you know, you don't need to purify your sample, but you can actually look at uh, uh, things in the cell or in their native environment. So obviously that's why we go the extra work of you know, making this more complicated data collection. So we can actually uh, uh, look at things in the native, uh, uh, proteins in the native state. Um, and obviously, one of the sort of things that are associated to cryo electron tomography, is this, is, this is an essentially a low throughput technique and that yields essentially very low resolution. And I wanna, you know, the focus of my talk is how do we go about actually changing that, right? So making this uh, a high throughput technique uh, that I can actually achieve high resolution. So in terms of the data analysis, um, because the, the, the data is collected in this different way, obviously the, the data processing is gonna be a little bit more complicated uh, compared to single particle. So there's many more steps. I'm here, I'm showing like uh, the pipeline, the data processing pipeline in CryoIT, where you collect your TIL series, you need to do the align the TIL series, and then you convert that into a 3D reconstruction, which is the, the tomographic reconstruction right here. And then hopefully you have some features in those um, tomograms that you can segment out and then you can maybe select features that repeat themselves within the tomograms. So you can then combine them by sub volume averaging and get uh, a final structure, right? So this is the part that is common with single particle cryo EM where we actually combine information from uh, many copies of uh, a given protein of interest. And then that's, we use that as a way to increase the resolution or overcome the low signal to noise ratio. So this is actually the figures that I'm showing here is work that I did when I was uh, in Serum's lab. This was like 12 years ago. Uh, so the virus to work on at that time was HIV. Um, so unlike today, 
Uh, so essentially, we use this technique to determine the native structure of uh, HIV-1 trimers on the surface of virions, right? So this is definitely not a good, uh, a new technique. It's been around for a while. Um, but obviously, you know, there hasn't been a lot going on in terms of uh, uh, improving or pushing the limits of this technology. Now, I want to give a little bit of a motivation, right? So why, you know, this should be pretty straightforward for this audience, but I just want to make sure that uh, we're all on the same page. Uh, why do we need high resolution, right? So that's pretty obvious. If you came to uh, Jane's talk a couple of weeks ago, um, I think she made a, you know, a very good point that obviously, you know, the higher resolution we can achieve, then, you know, we're gonna make fewer errors in our model building. So that's obviously good. That's something that we all, uh, uh, we all want, want to do. And I actually, you know, we have, uh, this is an interesting uh, data point. Uh, my lab is actually neighbors with Jane. So we talked about this all the time. Uh, so obviously, the main reason why we want to improve resolution is so we can make the, you know, the, determine the structures in a more accurate way and make fewer errors. Now, this plot that I'm showing here uh, is actually uh, what I call the, res the resolution report card for cardiac tomography, right? So what, I'm, what I did is I went to the EMDB and then I pulled out the average resolution for single particle and for tomography uh, for the different years uh, since 2007 to 2020. So the single particle one is shown in blue. So this is the average resolution for each year. You can see here the onset of the resolution revolution. And then if you fast forward to 2020, the average resolution of single particle cryo-M structures in the EMDB is actually around uh, six Armstrongs, uh, 5.9 or six in that neighborhood. And if you look at the same numbers uh, from tomography, it's obviously you know, much worse. And actually in 2020, that average resolution is at uh, about 30 Armstrongs. So obviously there is a huge difference, right? In going from, from six uh, to 30. And you know, this is, I think it's a problem that needs to be fixed. And you know, the tools that I'm gonna be talking about today actually go about addressing how do we actually close this resolution gap uh, between tomography and single particle, which will allow us to do, uh, you know, high resolution uh, in situ structure determination, uh, which is, uh, you know, the, the ultimate goal here. Now, the second part is the speed, right? So why do we need speed? Um, and for that, I also went to the EMDB and pulled up some numbers. Uh, so if you look at all the uh, subvolume averaging structures in the EMDB that are better than 4.5 Armstrongs, there are actually 13 entries like that. And uh, so the average resolution is about 3.9 Armstrongs, right? So this is near atomic resolution. And obviously, you know, to get to those resolutions, you need to be imaging at a small enough pixel size. So usually these are, you know, pixel sizes smaller than two Armstrongs, uh, uh, which essentially means that uh, with the size of detectors that we have today, we can only image a very small field of view of you know, around 500 nanometers. This is just some ballpark numbers, uh, but meaning that we can only look at a very small area because we're imaging at very small pixel size. Now, the other interesting data point is this last line right here. And if you look at the number of subvolumes of or particles that were used to determine these high resolution structures, they are in the order of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the average is about 90,000 particles, right? So this is a lot of particles. Um, so the problem is that if you're looking at such a small area and you need to accumulate that many particles, you will essentially have to take uh, image many, many areas from your grid. And that's where the speed comes from, right? So if you're not able to do that uh, quickly, then essentially you won't be able to build up your numbers to get you to this, uh, you know, in the order of 100,000 particles, which will allow you to get to high resolution. So here is one example. I, you know, from these 13 entries, I looked at uh, EMD 4015, which is from the from uh, John Briggs, uh, and this is a structure of the HIV one capsid uh, SP1, which was sold at uh, 3.9 Armstrong resolution. This was from, uh, a few years ago, and in this particular case, there were a total of 52 series that were used to get to this resolution. Now. Uh, if you look at the concentration of particles in each field of view, 
it comes out to be about you know, between 2,000 and 3,000 particles per field of view. So obviously this is a very favorable uh, sample where you can actually squeeze in that many particles into a single series, right? And this is how you actually you know, overcome the, the low throughput uh, um, property of CrowdIT. But in most other cases, right, where you cannot get this high concentration of particles, uh, in each in, a, in one two series, you're going to have much fewer copies. So in order to make up for that, you have to image many, many more areas. So this is essentially why you know, we need to move to higher uh, speed tomorrow. So what can we do today, right? So if you want to do a gravity project and then you go, you, you're doing some data collection, essentially you have two options. Um, and you essentially need to choose whether to go for resolution or speed. So if you go for resolution, the data collection is going to be slow. And if you go for speed, your resolution is not going to be that great. Um, so the two schemes that uh, you know, uh, are in use today is uh, so the uh, dosimetric scheme, which is the, you know, from Wim Hagen, uh, which you can image at fairly small pixel sizes. Uh, this is the, you know, the regular tilting scheme, plus minus 60, every three degrees. And this, I just put some numbers here for the K2 camera. And you know, to give you a sense of how slow this is, you know, acquiring a single tilt series, uh, it takes about half an hour. So these numbers can change depending on the settings, but just to you know, give some rough idea, um, about half an hour for, for a tilt series. So this is obviously, much, much slower than the few seconds that it takes to collect a single particle image. So you can already tell you know, why we're calling this you know, the low, low throughput technique. Um, but if you do this uh, and you, can, you have enough copies of your protein of interest uh, within your set of tilt series, you can actually get to near atomic resolution. Now, the second option, um, and this is work that has been done out of uh, Grand Jensen's lab at, at Caltech, um, they actually came up with this uh, fast incremental single exposure scheme that actually allows you to collect data much more quickly, um, but it becomes uh, more difficult the, the, the smaller the pixel size, right? So in this case, this example is a 2.7 Armstrong per pixel, which obviously will not be compatible with near atomic resolution. You will need to go to a much smaller pixel size. And then there's you know, issues of uh, stability and how do you maintain tracking and so forth. But essentially you can collect a tilt series much more quicker you know, in between four to five minutes. And again, these numbers, they vary from, uh, from microscope to microscope depending on the, on the conditions, but it just gives you an idea that you get a significant speed up, uh, but then on the other side, you won't get uh, to such high resolution. So there's been some examples that Collect, if you collect data this way, you can actually get to sub nanometer, sub nanometer resolution, but uh, and you can collect data a lot uh, quicker that way. So the whole point here is, can we actually get the two things? Can we actually collect data quicker, but also get the high resolution? So in order to, to do that, there's two things or two problems that we need uh, to solve. So the first problem is because we're imaging at very high mag, right? The, the tracking becomes very, very important because we need to make sure that our sample or you know, the region of interest stays within um, the field of view across all tilts. So when you have a field of view of you know, 400 nanometers like uh, is shown in this uh, red square here, uh, obviously your tracking needs to be very, very precise. Um, if you were looking at a, you know, a, a much bigger area, this is less of an issue, but for smaller areas, this actually becomes very critical. So that was one of the problems that we needed to solve uh, when we developed a bisect. And the way we improved the tracking was by uh, implementing a, a two-step uh, centering procedure uh, using a low mag and high mag. And then we also added some uh, predictive tracking routines that actually adapt as we, as we collect the data. So I won't talk about the details, but uh, essentially we have uh, an implementation done uh, on serial EM. And then we have this uh, external block that is actually receiving the data from serial EM, 
and is doing you know all the calculations of the geometry of the the, the, the tilting and the recontraction and then is sending back uh, that information to CLM so we can actually get uh, the, the tracking to be more accurate. So this is a movie uh, with a 1.3 Armstrong pixel size. So you can see the scale bar here is 100 nanometers. And you know you can't really see the particles here because they're small, but you can see the gold fiducials and then you can tell that uh, we have a pretty good overlap. I think it's you know in the order of you know, 80 to 90% uh, of the area, it stays within the uh, the field of view, which means that uh, you're going to be able to utilize that, that entire area uh, for picking particles. Um, now, the second challenge here is now that we have very precise tracking, how do we go about uh, improving the speed? So in order to do that, um, I'm sure there are many experts, electron tomography experts in the audience, but for those that may not be too familiar with this, I will spend a couple of minutes of going through the, you know, the process of actually data collection in, in crowd tomography. So the way this is done, I'm showing here a low mag image of a crowd EM grid. And uh, essentially there is a sequence of steps that happen in order for us to get a T series. So if we want to collect a T series from the position number one, uh, the first thing we need to do is to actually uh, uh, move the stage so we can uh, be on that target. Then there is a centering step. And here I'm uh, putting some numbers for how long each of the steps uh, uh, takes roughly, just to give you an idea. So there is the moving of the target, there is the centering, and then there is the focusing, and then there is a wait time. So, you know, these are all, uh, you know, the, the movements are actually mechanical movements. So we need to add some setting time for things to, uh, uh, to stabilize. And then after we done through these uh, four different steps, only then we're ready to actually take an image, right? And uh, essentially this process is repeated over and over. So once we take, let's say the zero tilt projection image, then we go back, uh, we now tilt the stage to three degrees. We redo the centering, the focusing, we wait, and then we acquire the data again. And then we do this, you know, whatever, uh, number of projections we have in our T-series. Normally we have you know, between 30 and 40. So you go through this entire loop essentially uh, 40 times. So obviously, you know, this, it, it's a very slow process. And then once you're done with the area one, you have your T-series, you go to the, the area number two, and then you repeat this process again. And then you go through your, you know, all, how many holes uh, in your grid that you have for imaging. So you can you know, obviously get the idea that uh, this is obviously very, very time consuming because it involves a lot of you know, mechanical movement of the stage and you know, all the centering and focusing and just uh, waiting time for, for stabilizing. So the question is, uh, can we, you know, how do we make that better? How do we make it go quicker? And uh, the idea is pretty simple, right? So, uh, what we're going to try to do is to uh, use beam image shift here. So beam image shift, uh, I'm going to call BIS uh, from now on. Uh, essentially, this allows you to uh, move your imaging area just by deflecting the beam, right? So there's no mechanical movement involved. It's just deflecting the beam. Um, this is in the regular mode. And then when you deflect the beam, essentially you're imaging at a different area here shown in the red circle. So by simply deflecting the beam, the beam, you can uh, image a, a neighboring hole, for example, or you know, a different area within the same hole. And this essentially, it's, it's very fast because you know, there's, there's no mechanical uh, movement involved. And we actually use this routinely in single particle CRIM, right? Uh, so most facilities, I think nowadays, they use um, um, beam image shift uh, in order to uh, co collect the data much, much faster than, than was possible bef uh, before. So the idea is, can we actually um, extend this to tomography, right? So that's, uh, it's a very simple idea. And the solution is exactly that. So um, when we first came up with this idea, I know it seems like a pretty straightforward idea, but the implementation were actually, you know, uh, pose a lot of uh, uh, hurdles and, and it was actually quite difficult to get all the components in place. But the point is this, um, Let's go back to the, uh, the first position where we're trying to collect a T-series. 
So now uh, we move the, the target to that position. Uh, we do the centering uh, on that target. We do the focusing and then we wait for things to stabilize. And then instead of taking a single image, we actually do beam image shift to all the neighboring, um, the, all the neighboring holes. And in this case, I'm showing like a three by three pattern. So where we're taking nine images instead of one. And so essentially what this allows you to do is to do all these expensive steps only once, right? And then take a whole bunch of images. So obviously that's a much, much more efficient way uh, of doing things. Um, and the next thing you need to do after you've taken all these nine images, you now go and mechanically tilt the stage, right? There's not, no way we can do that uh, by just messing up the beam. So we need to mechanically um, uh, tilt the stage. And then we go back to here, we center, we focus, we wait, and we do that only once. And then again, we collect uh, nine images in this case. So you can see you know, where the savings are actually uh, coming from. So essentially what this allows us to do is to do high speed parallel acquisition of tilt series, uh, where we now go to doing a single tilting cycle. So from minus 60 to plus 60. And then instead of getting a single tilt series, if we're using a five by five um, uh, beam image shift pattern, we actually get uh, 25 tilt series all at once, right? So this is essentially where the, you know, where the speed is actually coming from. Now, there is many, many details um, you know, regarding the implementation of this. Uh, as you can see from this drawing, you know, the, this is depicting the grid as a perfect plane. So things are obviously not like this in reality. So you know, the, the grids are actually not flat. And that introduces a lot of uh, things that you need to worry about in order to get the targeting just right for each and every tilt. Um, but this, you know, it gives you an idea for you know, where this, the speed up is actually coming from. So how does, does that look like in numbers? So bisect in numbers. So if you're using a, a K2 camera and using the regular plus minus 60 frames every three degrees where you're taking 41 images and you're using a five by five pattern, like, you know, 25 series, uh, two series, like I just showed before, then essentially you can get a, a seven minutes per tier series, right? Which is uh, uh, fairly quick. Now, if we take uh, fewer images, so in this case, we usually like to collect uh, fewer images in a limited uh, tilt range of plus minus 36, and then we only take 31 images, then the timing goes down to five minutes. Um, and then I have, if you switch to a faster K3 camera, right, you actually get, uh, for the first condition, you can only get you can get a series in only three minutes, and for the second condition, you get a tilt series in only two minutes, right? And essentially, what this allows you to do is, you know, if you're doing automated data collection, you can actually get 800 tilt series on a single day, right? So I didn't make a mistake in putting this number in. This is actually what you can actually get on a single day. Um, so we just did uh, a data collection over a weekend. Uh, we got, you know, like a 1400 till series uh, in a couple of days. So this is, you know, it's, I think it's absolutely, you know, amazing that you can actually get, you know, this many till, till series um, in such a short amount of time. So it really increased the throughput uh, dramatically by, you know, at least a factor of, of 10. Now, um, the actual uh, speed up obviously depends on how many areas you're able to image at each tilt, right? So obviously the more areas uh, you, you can image, then the, the speed up is gonna go up because you're actually uh, you know, leveraging those uh, very uh, slow steps in the process by uh, you know, taking the multiple images. So here we did uh, a graph where we actually show um, for the different cameras, the, K, the K2 and the K3, uh, we show here on the Y axis, the time per tilt series. And then on the X axis is the number of uh, regions of interest or the number of uh, neighboring areas that you take at each position. And you can see that obviously, you know, the more areas you have, then the lower is the time per tilt series. So we try, uh, you know, a couple of conditions uh, on an article, we use a three by three pattern 
and then uh, you get depending on the camera you use you can get to you know in this case it's about uh, 12 uh, 12 minutes and if you use a k3 it's obviously a lot less and the more areas you use so in a creos we're now routinely using five by five uh, uh, patterns so in this case we have uh, 25 and then the numbers obviously you know they go down dramatically now um, there is you know, a limitation here. It doesn't scale uh, linearly, obviously. So you know, if you have like you know a ten by ten uh, pattern and you have hundred positions uh, in that case, uh, that will actually be faster. But you will actually start approaching this uh, theoretical limit here. That uh, essentially you will be limited by the the, the slow steps uh, in this process. Um, but 25 seems to be like, you know, you do get a, a, a very significant uh, improvement and you also don't get, you know, too many effects because of the, of the beam shift and so forth. So the question is, you know, this is great. You no, know, it's, it's great to be able to get this many two series so quickly, but uh, how about the data quality, right? So, and this is where the second part comes into play, right? We do need to make sure that this data is actually conducent uh, to high resolution. So what we did in order to validate this, uh, we image uh, this uh, test sample, in this case, uh, this protein uh, DN uh, TBAs. Um, so this is a single particle sample, so it's a monodispersed sample that we just added uh, gold fiducias to prepare them for, for the tomography. And, you know, unlike your typical samples are used for cardiac tomography, which are typically ribosomes, which are in the order of you know, two to three uh, megadaltons. This is a pretty small protein, it's, uh, it's only 300 kilodaltons in size. So that makes it uh, more challenging because obviously the contrast is gonna be lower, uh, but it has some symmetry, which obviously is, is helpful. But this is what we decided to, you know, we decided to test this on a fairly challenging sample uh, at least from you know, the, the by tomography standards. So we went ahead and collected uh, on a CRIOS with a K2 and an energy filter using uh, 1.37 Armstrong per pixel. And we collected uh, 25 uh, positions per area. So using a five by five uh, beam image shift pattern. And this essentially boils down to, you know, uh, each two series takes uh, less than five minutes. And then we went ahead and did uh, put all this data through the um, um, data processing pipeline. And essentially we were able to uh, confirm that in this case out of uh, 64 T series, so here you can see the particles of each TPS. Uh, so again, a fairly small particle. Um, by doing the sub volume averaging, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, we were able to get uh, from 34 southern particles right, from 64 T series, a near atomic resolution map, uh, at, in this case, at 3.6 Armstrong, where we can obviously see um, density for most of the side chains. So this is you know, definitely a, a very good 3.6 Armstrong map uh, that we can actually get uh, from tomography. So we're not just able to collect data faster, but it's also high quality. And this actually uh, proves that the, you know, the the image quality is, uh, it should allow you to get to, to very high resolution. Now, in order to, uh, you know, make a comparison, right, with the, what we, with the single particle, which is, you know, the, uh, our gold standard here, uh, we actually did take a data set from the SEG grid, uh, just using, you know, the standard uh, single particle cryo-EM, and then we also did the, the 3D reconstruction uh, using single particle and then compare the two maps. So on the, on the top here, I'm showing, uh, you know, this data set was actually a little bit bigger. So we had 275 TIL series of which we selected the best 64. And then that's what gave us the 3.6 Armstrong resolution uh, reconstruction, which is shown here. And for the single particle data set, we actually collected uh, from many more areas, actually, you know, uh, 10 times more areas. So we collected 2,275 uh, uh, movies in this case, 
right? And then we also did the same, uh, select the first or the best 64 microbes and then put that through the single particle pipeline and got a reconstruction, which is a slightly higher resolution is 3.3. Um, and you can see the, the, the FSC plot here, but uh, obviously, you know, the single particle here had a little bit of an advantage because you had much more, uh, power, um, you know, the, the chances that you would get uh, 64 very high quality microbes are much higher if you're choosing from a pool of 2000 out of 200. So this is not completely fair comparison, but still you know, allows us to see, you know, how do we do compared to to, to regular uh, single particle cry. Now, interestingly, if you compare these two maps and you look at the order regions of the map, they actually show uh, the, the features are actually very similar. So the overall resolution is actually lower, but uh, the features are actually not that different. Uh, you can see uh, obviously all this uh, you know, density for most of the side chains, at, at least in this very, you know, the better parts uh, of the structure. Now, I want to switch gears now and tell you about uh, or focus more on the action, you know, on the data analysis part in, in CryoIT, which I think it's, uh, you know, it's a lot more stimulating than it is in, in single particle cry. So I show you at the beginning briefly the, the processing pipeline. Um, so we collect the T series, we do the regular T series alignment, reconstruction, uh, segmentation, particle picking, sub volume averaging, and then we get our final map. So that's like the, the standard workflow. And a few years ago, actually, again, when I was in, in Serum's lab, this was um, about eight years ago, this was, you know, there were no direct electron detectors back then, uh, just CCDs. So we were doing a tomography and we came up with this idea of actually, instead of following the regular pipeline, uh, we just go back to the original TIL series and extract the 2D projections from the, from the raw TIL series, right? And then I won't get into the details, but uh, you know, this approach, uh, essentially you cut the particles and then you put them directly into a 3D reconstruction, pretty much the same way you do in single particle cry. Now, because you have the relationship of the, the, the tilting, uh, you actually need to impose constraints uh, when you align projections coming from the same particle. And that's why we named this approach uh, constrained single particle uh, tomography, which I'm going to be calling CSPT uh, from now on. Uh, but essentially doing things this way has a lot of benefits uh, and obviously leads to you know, major improvements in resolution. So again, this is in the CCD era a uh, long time ago, but we were essentially able to show that if you do it this way, you can get an improvement from, you know, in this case, you no, know, I think it's like two um, uh, 20 Armstrongs all the way to sub nanometer resolution, which is the, the structure on, on the right here, which is solved at uh, seven Armstrongs. So that's a sub nanometer resolution using the same data, just by, uh, you know, analyzing the data using this different approach. Um, and just to give you the, you know, the main uh, benefits of actually using that approach, um, and those are listed here on the right, uh, obviously we are skipping all the intermediate steps and we're going straight from the raw data to the 3D, right? So that, that way where, um, you know, there's fewer chances of us, uh, you know, introducing problems in the, in the data processing and so forth. And uh, this is actually, you know, what, what we do in single particle. So it was obviously inspired by that. Um, the second uh, advantage is that we now are back in the single particle crowd EM world, which we actually know very well and tools have been, you know, are actually quite mature. So we can actually leverage all that uh, computational power and just plug the CRIT data into that framework and automatically be able to you know, take advantage of all those advances. Um, there's also another advantage, which I you know I didn't get into the details, but when we do the two series alignment, we rely on fiducials. Um, and when we do it in, in this way, we can actually have an alignment procedure, which is actually data driven. 
So the alignment of the two series is going to be given by the signal coming from the particles and not from the gold fiducials. So that will automatically give you higher resolution. And the last point is that gives, this gives you a lot more flexibility uh, because now you can actually mix and match the different projections. Uh, you don't have a single sub-volume with everything is uh, merged together, but you actually have a final granularity and then you can mix and match. You can discard the high tilt projections. It just gives you, you know, a very flexible uh, framework um, that you know, essentially allows you to uh, improve resolution very significantly. Now, what we did was uh, we adopted this, obviously, and we threw in a couple of improvements. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about uh, now. So we improved this in two different ways. So the first improvement that we did is regarding the CTF estimation. So as you can see here, once you have this setup, right, and then use the constraint single particle tomography to get uh, your 3D reconstruction, you don't only need to extract your particles from each of your projections, but you need to assign uh, uh, the proper the focus value. So in single particle cry m when we have you know, a flat grid, we can just simply compute the power spectrum and then you know, estimate the, the defocus. Um, in this case, you know, you, I'm showing here the one dimensional profile uh, where we can actually very accurately measure the defocus and then we can plug, plug those values into the, into the reconstruction and then we can obviously get a high resolution uh, reconstruction. Now, the only difference here is that uh, these zero tilt images are actually uh, have much lower dose and lower contrast because the dose were, was actually fractionated, right, among all the different tilts. Um, but you can still get a, a pretty good, uh, you know, pretty strong signal in the power spectrum, especially with the new detectors to actually be able to determine the, the, the focus accurately. Now, when you look at the tilted images, obviously the story is very different. Right, so in the in the tilted images, if you just go and apply your you know your favorite CTF estimation uh, program, uh, you will get something like this, right, where you actually don't really see you know all the tone rings, and then your your the focus estimation is going to look uh, like a mess, and then obviously you will not be able to uh, to plug those values into the reconstruction in order to achieve high resolution. So obviously, you know there's the reason that's the case is because on these tilted projections, right, you actually have a gradient of the focus and, you know, people have developed uh, tools to actually estimate this, uh, the focus gradient uh, on, the, on the single particle world, um, uh, which essentially you can estimate, you know, the, the geometry of that tilted plane and essentially it boils down to figuring out the the tilt axis, so the orientation of the tilt axis, and then the tilt angle, which is out of plane. And then by knowing that uh, geometry, you can actually um, produce a combined uh, power spectrum um, that actually uh, uses the signal from the entire tilted image to increase the signal in the power spectrum and allows you to do the, the estimation more precisely. Now, uh, these projections, as I said before, are obviously uh, lower dose. Um, so just going and trying to find, uh, you know, these two parameters, these two angles, is going to be very difficult because the, the, the signal to noise ratio is going to be very low. So what we thought about doing instead was to actually leverage the information that comes from the tilt series alignment, right? During tilt series alignment, we're precisely determining uh, these two values. So what we do is we just plug these two values into these um, um, CTF estimation procedures for, for tilted images. And that's how we get now a power spectrum, even for a high tilt image that has a signal going to high resolution. So this again is showing the, the one dimensional profile. And now even for the tilted images, we're able to get a very accurate value. And you know, I'm obviously skipping many details here but it's just to give you, you know, the, the, the general idea. You know, we, because we also correct for the relative position of each particle within the, the eyes and so forth. So, but this is just the, you know, the, the overall idea. Um, and essentially what we have is a way of measuring uh, 
the fully asymptotic uh, CTF on a per tilt basis. Um, here I'm showing a series from uh, minus six uh, to minus 60. And you can see that you know, for each and every image, by using the information that we have from the tilt series alignment, uh, we can actually just plug those values into the tilt CTF uh, routines and get a single power spectrum where we can actually estimate uh, all the parameters of the CTF. So that was the, the first improvement. And obviously we know from single particle that having a, uh, you know, accuracy CTF estimation is absolutely critical uh, for improving resolution. So this is obviously going to be very, very helpful for uh, improving the resolution of the, the, the sub-volume average and uh, reconstructions. Now, the second thing that we added to this was the, the exposure filtering. And again, uh, we know obviously from a uh, single particle crowd EM that uh, exposure filtering uh, is very useful and can actually help uh, improve the resolution by quite a bit. So this is you know, a couple of years ago, uh, we implemented this data-driven exposure filter for uh, single particle analysis. And there's obviously you know, other similar solutions out there. But uh, essentially, you can, by precisely uh, filter the, filtering the exposures, um, you can uh, get a lot more of the high resolution information out of your movies in this case. Uh, so the idea here is, can we actually bring those ideas into the tomography framework, right? So this is the, again, because we have this constrained single particle um, strategy, we can actually translate all of these ideas into the model. So the way we do that is um, slightly different than it's done in 2D. So in, in single particle, uh, so here we have a movie of one of our particles and essentially we can, we can do is we can measure the contribution of each of our frames and we can quantify that contribution. So we know that uh, in the early part of the exposure, those frames are going to have um, more uh, useful high resolution information. And then uh, towards the end of the exposure, uh, those will only contribute to the low resolution. And essentially what we can do is we can come up with these weights in frequency space, and then we can combine all these movie frames into a single image that now has been uh, exposure filter. Um, and if you look at this diagram, essentially what this is saying is that at low resolution here, all your frames are actually contributing to the low resolution terms. And in high resolution, only your best frames are actually contributing that information, which are, are coming from this curve right here. And then once you have your exposure corrected particle, you can just put that into, the, into your theta reconstruction and you're done, right? Now in tomography is obviously a little bit more complicated because now your, your frames or your tilts now are not in the same plane. So you won't be able to just, uh, uh, Put them all together into a single plane, so you had to keep them as separate planes. Uh, but it turns out that if you take each of those planes, you can actually measure the relative contribution just like you did here. So you can measure here, uh, now this is shown as a function of the tilt angle, so uh, this is the zero tilt and you can see that those are the ones that um, have a higher uh, resolution content and then as you go uh, you know, to the higher tilts and you know, later exposures, obviously the information content starts to fall, to, to fall down. Um, and again, the difference here is that now, you know, you need to do the weighting within the 3D reconstruction, right? You cannot just merge uh, the images because they're not on the same plane. So what we did is we actually um, implemented this on top of a reconstructed strategy in, in system and we actually incorporated uh, these weights. And then that way we're able to produce uh, exposure filter 3D reconstruction that obviously will lead uh, to higher resolution maps. So in a nutshell, um, I'm showing here for the DGTPA structure. Uh, so if we start from the baseline reconstruction in this case was at 5.3 Armstrongs using incorporating the tilt CTF model, we were able to improve that to 4.6 Armstrongs and then adding on top of that, the exposure weighting or filtering, that's how we got to the final uh, 3.6 uh, Armstrong resolution. 
So I think we're about 10 minutes from the end. So I'm gonna wrap it up uh, here. Um, just, you know, I, I ask myself this question all the time, you know, where is CryoIT headed right now? And you know, by the way, everything that I presented today, it's in this uh, bioarchive paper. Uh, so you, you can go and look at the details uh, there. But uh, in a nutshell, right, we are essentially able now to do uh, fast uh, uh, collection of till series, right? Which is very important, right? Though we, we need to be data rich in order to be able to, to move forward. And, you know, I cannot stress enough how important R is to develop, you know, better strategy for crowd EM. And this is why, you know, I wanted to uh, stress this, especially to this audience that, you know, there's definitely a, a lot that needs to be done uh, for us to be able to close this resolution gap between single particle and tomography. So I show you the report card already. Uh, it's not looking, it's, it's not looking great. So uh, I think we need to change that. So the, the things, uh, you know, the faster data collection and the better image processing is, you know, those are the two things that will get us there. And again, just to reiterate, the main reason we wanna do this is so we can do in situ imaging um, at high resolution. So with that, I'd like to uh, make some acknowledgements. So first of all, thanks to Roy, Joachim, Dorit and, and Steve for organizing this forum, which I think it's, it's great. Um, everything that I presented today has been a great collaboration uh, with Mario Borneas group at NIHS. Um, so specifically Jonathan uh, Bubet, he did uh, you know, all of the heavy lifting on actually get this bisect implemented in Serial EM. Um, and then there's people from my uh, lab that were involved in the single particle analysis, in the constraint single particle tomography, and also on implementing the, the, the exposure weighting scheme uh, in system. Uh, obviously, um, people from the, the UNC CryoM Core, uh, Duke's uh, TM uh, team. Uh, a lot of the data that I presented today was collected at NCI. So uh, Rick Huang, uh, he, uh, he was also you know, very helpful in uh, getting all this data and getting you know, BISEC installed uh, into that uh, CRIOS. And obviously the support from the, you know, the, the research computing uh, at Duke. And I also like to acknowledge that we had some early conversations with uh, David Marchonader, which uh, were also uh, very helpful. And also I like to acknowledge you know, the, the system uh, team. Uh, so team um, Alexis and Nico uh, for making you know, available all these new routines for CTF Find 4 that actually can do uh, till CTF estimation, um, which I think it's a great example of you know, how things actually move forward. So with that, I'd like to uh, stop and then pass the floor to Roy so we can uh, have people ask questions. <laughs>